All right. Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming today to today's Folio Forum, uh, which is sponsored by the Open Library Environment uh, in partnership with EBSCO and Index Data. My name is Peter Murray, and I am the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's event. Our topic today is the Folio Roadmap. Uh, today's session, like all Folio forums, is being recorded and will be posted to the Open Library Environment website. Uh, as an open forum, uh, participants can see each other and all questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers uh, to ensure good sound quality. Uh, we value your participation and encourage you to engage in this topic. Uh, Using the question box within WebEx, uh, you can enter your questions and comments as they come to you. Uh, and uh, today's speaker will address the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you like to tweet, uh, please use the Twitter hashtag FolioForum. Uh, but please know that we may not see your comments there uh, during the forum. Uh, we also encourage you to continue the conversation about the Folio Roadmap on the Folio Discussion website, uh, and that is discuss.folio.org. Our speaker today is Harry Kaplanian. No, Kaplan, Kaplanian. Sorry, Harry. Uh, Harry is the director of product management at EBSCO Information Services. Uh, prior to joining EBSCO, he was the director of product management at Serial Solutions. Uh, Harry has also worked for Microsoft, uh, helping develop the uh, live search, uh, live book search. Uh, served as vice president of development at Mandarin Library Automation, and was previously director of development at SERS Publishing. Uh, Harry holds a degree in computer science from Florida State University. And outside libraries, uh, his interests are skiing and gardening. So we'll see if any of that comes into play with today's presentation. Uh, Harry, I'll turn it over to you. Hello. Thank you for the introduction, Peter. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we have a significant amount of time blocking for presentation, but it won't take nearly that long, and so um, hopefully that's acceptable to most. <laughs> so we are going to talk about the roadmap, the Folio roadmap. There's a little bit of an introduction beforehand before we get to the roadmap. Um, again, not too many slides, and we should get through this relatively quickly. Um, Harry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I don't see your slides being displayed yet. Okay. Here they come, I think. Yes, all set. Thank you, Harry. All right. Okay, so um, here we go. So you know, I, I'd like to start off. Um, this is a quote from uh, an article written by Curtis Bundy in the Journal of Library Automation. And um, at the beginning of this article, he makes a statement, academic libraries are facing times of unprecedented challenge and parallel change. Innovation has moved from a consideration to a necessity. And we, Folio, uh, we fully believe this. And in looking around at the options that are out there and available and the tools that are available for libraries today, we're not convinced the systems, the mechanisms, the platforms are out there that can truly help libraries achieve those goals that they see themselves achieving maybe next year, five years, or maybe even 10 years from now. Um, as libraries, we need to innovate and we need the tools to help us get there. One of the issues we see out there, of course, is choice. Um, there aren't that many providers anymore, and what is being provided, these next generation systems, are really what are being called library service platforms. And library service platforms have essentially evolved into the library market as to really these 
all in one packages. And, you know, as this quote states, there's nothing wrong with bundling. And, you know, in many cases as libraries, you are all used to that in terms of how you purchase content and systems. But the issue is, are these bundles relevant to your needs? You know, this isn't really a one size fits all game. And so really what we believe our libraries are asking for the opportunity to create these customized bundles that reflect their preferences and processes and the goals that they hope to achieve over some period of time in their libraries. And so, you know, I just made a statement there about library services platform and, you know, platforms are really changing the world as we know it. I mean, there are entire industries that are undergoing rather dramatic change because of these systems. And although we are using terminology in the library world called library service platforms, you know, in reality, they're not really service platforms. And so, for example, um, one really good case, and there are many others, is uh, currently from Amazon, right? There's this device called um, the Echo. And the Echo is essentially a speaker and a microphone connected to the internet. And its real strength comes from this platform called Alexa behind the scenes that actually powers this. And what's great about Alexa is it's essentially a communication platform where other applications and services can connect and contribute. And so, for instance, you know, there's some logos here on this slide, but um, if Amazon were to all of a sudden start creating uh, automated light bulbs, thermostats, or start baking pizza, I don't think I'd want to buy that from them because, to be honest, there are other vendors that specialize in that and do a much better job. Um, what's interesting about Alexa, it allows these other vendors and other organizations that really focus in specific areas and do the best that they can possibly do in that space, plug into Alexa. And Amazon even has a, a term for this. Instead of what you might call a plug-in, plug they actually call them skills. So other organizations can create skills that plug into the platform that then essentially teach um, Echo what to do. And so, for instance, if you want the weather, that's a skill that's plugged in. If you want to control your lights or the temperature in your home, those are skills provided by other vendors that plug in. And so what you end up having or forming is this ecosystem of all these different services that are provided by many different organizations that ultimately mean a whole lot more and can provide a whole lot more than the sum of the parts. And then because you have this system where they all interoperate, you start to do some really amazing things in terms of not just the relationships between them, but this little speaker and microphone here with Alexa actually provides an entirely new user interface that none of these vendors were ever thinking of and frankly don't have the expertise to provide. And in this case, it's voice, which is really quite a sophisticated and amazing thing to do. And so, you know, there are other examples of service platforms as well, right? Like the Android phone uh, operating system in the marketplace, um, the Apple iPhone as well, and there are other cases as well. And so when we think about this idea of the platform, these are the things, or a service platform, these are the things we should be thinking about, and these are the things that the Folio, the Folio project expects to bring to the library marketplace. And so the value of an ecosystem like this is not actually any one vendor or organization. It's all the different members or all the different organizations that take part. And so for that to happen in Folio, there is this thing we call Okapi, which is really the middle layer, the communication layer, the gateway for all other services to plug in. There is a system layer as well, which deals with persistence and storage. And something that's missing from this diagram also is a UI toolkit as well. Because although we expect many vendors to plug in, um, we would like to see, in fact, we expect to see, and that's what we're focused on as part of the roadmap, is as these different applications start to plug in, they should use a common user interface toolkit so we can provide a consistent user interface. That said, there's nothing stopping from anyone 
for building something, an application that can plug in and connect and use its own native interface as well. And this is, again, very similar to the example previously of Echo and Alexa from Amazon. I can still go, uh, for instance, to the Philips View application and control the lighting in my house on my iPhone, um, but at the same time, I can actually control it using the voice interface as well, which is, again, really quite amazing. So for Folio to be valuable to libraries, it's going to have to release with some core functionality that allows libraries to actually operate with what it comes with. And so to that end, there's a series of basic applications that it must have. And so in this case, the little blue boxes are to represent acquisitions and everything relating to it, fund management, um, RM, which is resource management. And in Folio, when we talk about resource management, we're talking about all resource management. So this is not e-resource management or print. It's actually all of it combined in some way, shape, or form. And then we have circulation as well, because for those physical items, we still have to circulate those items. There will be other applications as well. And some of these will be built by the Folio organization. Um, some of them will be built by others. Whatever gets built by Folio in terms of applications, like for instance, these three that are listed, these will be open source applications that are available for everyone to use, examine. And so what we expect to see is as these start to release, there may be some organizations that actually have the development manpower to possibly change or modify these and add the features that make it more useful to them. Ideally, we'd even like to see groups forming or special interest groups that can maybe drive some of these applications in certain directions. And then ultimately, we expect to see a marketplace where libraries get to pick and choose the applications that best suit their needs. But beyond that, um, for instance, uh, we have these other apps that we'll have to plug in, and one of them is authentication, and ideally something related to SSO. There are multiple schemes and formats and systems out there, and we do expect all of those to plug in. Uh, discovery services as well. Discovery is not actually part of Folio itself. There are options out there, some open source, some closed source, and we fully expect all of those will be able to interact and interoperate with Folio via Okapi. Um, selection, and when we mean selection, we're really talking more along the lines of storefronts. So the vendor that you work with in terms of content that you purchase, those tools that they use should be able to seamlessly plug in to Folio via Okapi and, for instance, communicate with acquisitions, with resource management, uh, with circulation as well. And interlibrary loan, again, there are multiple systems out there. Some of these built by organizations, consortia themselves. Some of them provided by other vendors. We fully expect those to integrate, and we do have organizations that are signing up to do this, in fact. Um, institutional repositories, um, this is another key, key aspect for many libraries. In many ways, this is one of the key areas where many libraries can differentiate against each other. They're oftentimes a really unique content, and in many ways, this classifies as a type of knowledge base as well that many libraries manage today and we fully expect that to integrate. There are learning management systems as well, as we all know, on campus. Um, we do expect to integrate with these as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then, of course, reporting or analytics as well. As we start to plug all these different systems in into this common layer, this common communication layer, we start to get this ability to uh, really join or combine data that's being generated by these different systems in a single place, which really ought to simplify reporting and analytics as we start to move forward. And so, for instance, some of the benefits we see here, of course, are we have users that are signing in via SSO, right? We should be able to keep really detailed information about what users are doing while completely protecting their privacy in terms of who they are. In theory, there's actually no reason for us to log any of that PII information. 
But since we do have this detailed data, we can start to combine both usage of e-content, of print content. We can tie this into the acquisitions that's going on, selection as well. We can take a look at usage that's being driven based on discovery, interlibrary loan as well, and frankly, the institutional repository as well. And then as we start to pull this in with the learning management systems, we should be in the ideal situation here where we should have a wealth of information that we can report on, that we can analyze, that helps tie us really to the campus and to really help prove our worth to the greater organization that, that this library is definitely a worthwhile endeavor and students that use this library get many positive outcomes and will have the data to back that up as well. The other piece, of course, here that's interesting is you know, we're looking at this right now, at least in this diagram, um, it, it's essentially representing a library, but Folio is not limited to single libraries where you're actually also putting a lot of work and focus and thought into what happens to combinations of libraries, um, consortia, districts, whatever the case may be. Ideally, at those higher level organizations, they should also be able to do the analysis, run the reports, and really get a full picture across all the libraries that are a member of that organization. We mentioned, or at least I mentioned a minute ago, knowledge base, and really no modern system um, can really operate, especially as it relates to e-content, without a knowledge base in some way, shape, or form. Um, one of the pieces we're moving forward with the folio, which at least I believe is very innovative, is we're not just talking about one knowledge base, and we don't believe any one vendor will be able to create that single, all-encompassing knowledge base that represents every piece of content that you could ever hope to manage. And so what we're actually working toward is being able to simultaneously connect to multiple knowledge bases. I mentioned earlier the institutional repository is really a knowledge base as it is. That's one. Um, we know there's going to be a knowledge base that, um, that helps track e-content. And there are knowledge bases out there that specialize in print and books as well. And we expect there'll be others as well, like national libraries have knowledge bases they maintain with specialized content. And so ultimately, we see the system be able, being able to interact and operate with multiple knowledge bases to provide the best benefits in terms of libraries being able to manage all the content that they're able to provide access to. I mentioned analytics a minute ago. Um, the other piece here that's really interesting and there's some thought going into as it relates to linked data. Um, as you start to think about what it's like to work within a system where it's actually interacting and operating with multiple knowledge bases across these apps and starting to manage holdings across these multiple knowledge bases, there start to appear what we believe are some pretty interesting opportunities for linked data as well. And so that will become a key part of this system as well. Are there any questions before I embark on the roadmap? Um, one moment here. No questions as of yet, Harry. Uh, proceed on. Okay, sounds good. All right. Uh, so, the roadmap. So, um, so roadmaps, roadmaps are plans, right? How do we get from point A to point B? At Folio, we have a particular goal in mind. Uh, we know we got to get there. And so this is our plan on how we expect to get there. Roadmaps are both interesting and sometimes really difficult because they tend to occur over a rather substantial period of time. And of course, as you're solving problems, building code, building applications, um, there's only so much you can focus on and so much you can know and understand. And part of the process, of course, is as you build, as you build requirements, as you write code, really you start to learn a lot about what's going on, what's going to need to go on, and what needs to happen to be successful. And so most roadmaps, if they're valid roadmaps, start off early in the early stages with a decent amount of detail up front. And of course, as the team starts to operate and actually work on this project, these learnings start to become applied to the roadmap 
and you start to gain more and more detail. And that detail, of course, many of the items you learn end up being put on a backlog because we can't work on it right now, but we know we have to do it, and so we're going to have to schedule this for a little bit of a later time. So as that backlog forms, as that understanding forms, the roadmap, of, of course, starts to gain more and more detail. And so we view this as really almost like a sliding window into this project called Folio. And so you'll see more detail in the beginning. As we move on a little bit later in the slides, there'll be significantly less detail. But again, we'll be revisiting this on a regular basis. And as we do, you'll start to see many of those details start to fill out. We tried to divide this roadmap into a quarterly basis, and we focus quarterly. It seemed like a reasonably sized chunks. As time goes on, we do expect more detail there as well. And for the quarters, we've set some goals for ourselves. And so one of the goals, the key goal we set for this quarter, Q4, is to be able to support multi-team independent app development as we exit this quarter and start the next one. And what we mean by this is right now there's a small core team of developers, index data actually, that have been doing the majority of the development work. They've been able to pull in some outside community developers, four if I'm not mistaken, and these are actually developers that were contributed by libraries. And of course, there's only so much that we can do with a team like that and of that size um, in terms of the full team of developers. And really, we don't foresee making huge progress on Folio if, as we move forward, in addition to maintaining the core of the system, the UI um, toolkit, um, the persistent subsystems, and our copy as well, while we're also trying to build all the applications. And as many of you know, in fact, all of you know, in a typical library automation system, there are many applications that are used to actually manage what goes on in the enterprise we call the library. And so what we really want to have happen is we want all this work on applications to actually happen in parallel, bringing in as much of the community as possible to help develop those applications. And so to do that, we need to prepare for that. And so our deliverables for this quarter are an exemplar app. And so we have the UI toolkit that's coming out. We've got Okapi. We've got the persistent systems that we're working on. How does a developer actually pull this all together, apply the business rules that they want to as part of the code that they're building to build and create what we would call a reference folio application that can plug into the system and look and act and deliver as we expect based on standards that we set. And so that exemplar app is currently in process and being built, and that's something we expect to deliver to the development community. One of the things I mentioned earlier as well was this UI toolkit to give developers the ability that are on different teams to build applications, but to make sure those applications look and feel like they belong to a single project. And so that's in process. Um, as well, and there's documentation being put together. Um, the team is getting ready to release that relatively soon this quarter. Um, there's still work going on in the persistent subsystem in terms of storage and retrieval of data. Okapi was actually released in July with documentation. It's out there, fully available source code documentation, everything else, but the team has been busy uh, refining, adding, improving Okapi as well. There's still work going on as far as schema definition in key domain areas like knowledge base management, resource management, including physical items, user management, search, etc. Also, there's UI design work going on. And what's actually happening is essentially, again, keeping in mind that idea or that goal of being able to support multiple teams working independently to build apps in parallel, we'd really like to see that start next quarter, the beginning of the year. So what we envision here is essentially trying to build a series of packages that can be handed over to these development teams. And a key part of those packages, of course, will be the UI design work for resource management, user management, circulation, record loading, and rights management. And in addition to that, of course, there are requirements as well, not just UI requirements. 
And so making sure the epics and stories and the prioritizations are set in JIRA, again, providing guidance to those external teams. Um, JIRA is actually already set up. Uh, we're in the process of starting to add and build out those epics and stories and prioritize them. That's publicly available to anyone who wants to go and take a look at it. It's out there and available for you. Um, build and release management as well. So it's one thing for some small focused teams to write build code and make it available. But as you start to, again, think about the idea of scaling out across multiple independent teams, um, the build process, the release process, uh, the QA process, unit tests, what have you, requires a lot more thought, a lot more process, and, and tools, frankly, as well. So this is also something the team is uh, also working on. And again, the goal being to get this ready for the next quarter so we can start to scale out on the development process. And then, of course, one of the outcomes or one of the deliverables for this quarter was a roadmap, which is what we're looking at. And we fully expect to update this on an almost continuous basis. And we'll be having periodic updates to the community as well so we can see how we're tracking against the roadmap and how the roadmap has changed over time. So as we move to Q1 2017, the goals change a little. And of course, at this point, ideally, we're in a position to start to onboard those multiple teams for the independent application develop, development, and ideally to start to develop, to deliver some very early initial versions of some of those selected apps. And these are not versions that you can run your library off of, but these are versions that I, I guess the best way to describe it in a very agile way, we should be able to provide some demonstrations. Um, the functionality most likely will be relatively rudimentary at this point, but it's enough to start to get feedback from the community, from libraries. Are we headed in the right direction? How do the requirements have to change? How can we make sure this absolutely delivers what libraries need? And so those initial versions, I guess I'd like to call them the point one versions of those apps, are really the ones that we tried to prepare for in the previous quarter, right? Um, the resource management, rights management, circulation, record loading. In addition to make this work, we expect we also need to start to see or work on uh, integrating a knowledge base, at least one, ideally more than one, because that is our ultimate goal. And for us to make some of these features and functionalities work, that has to happen. So ideally, the beginning of the next year, we will also start to see knowledge base integration as well. Also, because we want more parallel development to go on, not just on those initial apps that we identified previously, ideally the work continues on to create these packages um, of work that other teams can start to take on. And so again, the UI design work, for instance, for acquisitions, authentication, systems, operations, and management, um, the JIRA epics and stories and prioritization as well that we mentioned earlier, work continues on that. Um, in addition, uh, a documentation framework as well. As these different teams start to build out these apps, um, documentation is going to be required. Everything from how uh, these are set up and configured, usage, um, any technical documentation that might be required, and much like we mentioned in the UI, we also want this to appear as if it was created by a single entity to make it easy to navigate. And so at this point, we need to be making decisions about what that documentation framework is going to be, make it available so the different development teams and other folks that are contributing to this project, whether it be in product ownership, product management, um, uh, subject matter expertise from this means, um, we need to make sure there's a place for the documentation to be stored and maintained and updated. And also around this time, uh, reporting review and selection. Uh, we don't believe at this point that there's ever going to be a need for us to write or create a custom reporting system for Folio. Um, there are many open source great reporting systems that are out there. And so at least initially, what are the first one, or what it, which is the first one we're going to choose to try and integrate so it can make use of the system. And again, 
this is really aiming for V1 or really MVP to get a library up and running as early as possible. There's nothing stopping anyone from migrating or um, integrating any other reporting systems that may exist out there. So the goals starting a little later in 2017 become a little bit hazier. Um, and so really just focusing on that acquisitions workflow, systems operations and management. And ideally this is when we start to see some discovery integration as well. Discovery tools and services are not actually uh, a deliverable of Folio. We believe there are enough discovery solutions out there at the moment anyway, uh, some open source, closed source, um, that should be able to integrate with Folio with some work, of course. And so ideally, we're starting to see some of that happen at this point in time. Um, we expect to see the initial versions of acquisitions, authentication, operations management, reporting as well. Um, also, again, notice we're not necessarily expecting the library to get up and running here. These are still early days for these applications. And ideally, all of this work, everything that was started is happening in parallel. And as we get into the final six months of 2017, um, at this point, again, it's continued work to deliver those applications. Um, we also imagine at this point in time, again, you know, we mentioned the iPhone, we mentioned Android, we mentioned um, uh, Alexa, or uh, actually the Echo from Amazon. So these services have the equivalent of marketplaces, again, where users can go and select the apps that they want. Um, you know, uh, Apple built the iPhone, it had some basic functionality. They had no way of dreaming up or understanding how the iPhone would actually ultimately be used. And I really have a hard time believing they imagine the marketplace that exists today and the plethora of apps that exist out there today would actually be created to the point that it is today. But that's exactly what we want to see happen in Folio. We don't necessarily know what the future holds for libraries or where your innovation is going to reside. But we do want to make that platform available, which is Folio, that allows you or enables that to happen. And we do want to have that marketplace so those innovative applications and services can be made available to anyone that chooses to use Folio. Um, in addition, we imagine that the beginnings are at least starting to roll out this concept of idea of app approval, possibly, for the marketplace. Um, you know, ideally, we believe libraries want to know that if they go to a marketplace, when they select an app, there's a reasonable guarantee that it's not going to cause problems, that it should work, um, and that's something we're going to be aiming for as well. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of processes that need to be put in place to help us get to that point. And then ideally also, at this point, we expect to see a beta partner library start to migrate. And when we say migrate, really at this point, we're talking about taking all the data that ideally exists in the current system that they use to operate today and migrate it into an instance of Folio so we can get to better understand what's going to be required, the tool sets needed, what complications are we going to encounter so we can build and make those tools available to anyone that wants to migrate to Folio. This doesn't necessarily mean the library is actually going to be running at this point on Folio. And of course, in addition with uh, the documentation framework, the building out of the user guides um, as we expect users to use within libraries for the applications. 2018, all right, this is an even bigger span of time here. Um, it's yet even fuzzier. But ideally, we like to see that initial library go live. And at this point, I think it would be safe to claim that at least Folio as a project has delivered MVP or minimal viable product. It's enough to where a library could actually go live. Also during this time, um, we expect uh, the next five libraries to prepare to go live, to start working on migrations as well, using the learnings from that initial library. Five here is just a general number. Um, there's no real reason behind it other than it seemed like a reasonable number to work with. 
we actually have a substantially larger number of libraries that have volunteered to take this on. And so we do expect as time goes on, as they learn what's involved, as we learn about the tools and the different ILS systems that they may be using, they want to migrate. You know, maybe there's 20 libraries that originally said, yes, yes, we're ready to do this right away. We may find some decide they may need to wait a little bit until it becomes a little mature, so five seems like a big number. Also, in 2018, what we'd like to see is really, at this point, a self-sustained open source community, fully formed, meaning really the community itself is starting to fully make decisions on its own as to what comes next, what needs to happen, where the innovative applications are going to be, um, ideally maintaining the code base and um, maintaining the releases um, and really everything else related to that. Um, we'd really like to see that happen. And then at this point in time, I think, you know, it's safe to argue that, you know, general availability ideally has been achieved. We're really most libraries who want to take advantage of Folio somewhere in 2018 should be able to go to the site and either download a package and maybe install it or customize it themselves. But also at the same time, we expect to see vendors themselves jump in and we have receive notification from a good number of vendors that they fully expect to provide hosting services, customization, and support services, because we do recognize there are really a lot of libraries, if not most libraries, may not have the resources to either install, customize, what have you. So these external vendors are really the ideal way to provide that package and those services that many libraries are used to today when it comes to migrating to a new system. And I think that's it. Are there any questions? Uh, great, thank you, Harry. Uh, there have been some questions uh, that have come in. Uh, one that uh, relates to that uh, first quarter of uh, folio development. Uh, what's the... Uh, functional scope of the exemplar app? So as far as the actual functional scope, it's really just a showcase of what can be done. Um, and so the, the belief is it's going to be ideally something that's very basic. We haven't actually decided on that. It, right now, one of the things we've been discussing are some of the very, very most basic things that might represent, for instance, a circulation app. Because in addition to UI, in addition to Okapi, there are some other basic operations that could be included in that as well. But that's still not a final decision that's been made. Um, but still, it's something, for instance, like circulation. And there are other use cases that can be used as well. You know, it should allow us to search data within a system, update data within a system, search data, ideally create a transaction and log data as well. Um, that remains to be seen. Okay, uh, great. Uh, we've had a, another question uh, that's related to the uh, the marketplace. Can yeah. you give us an example of a marketplace app? Uh, maybe d discuss that concept some more. Sure. So uh, we see this really happening, um, in, well, in multiple areas. Let me go back to this chart here. So um, I guess what defines an app is an actually a fairly interesting concept as well. You know, some of these apps may correlate directly, for instance, to traditional ILS modules. And so, for instance, maybe there's a cataloging app that gets built. Um, but we imagine possibly multiple cataloging apps, right? So, for instance, MarkEdit exists out there as a tool that's used by libraries all over the place. I personally would absolutely love to see that as a Folio app. And if that were a tool that libraries chose to use, they should be able to select that from that marketplace and make it act and interoperate within their system. Um, I also imagine cases, for instance, um, interlibrary loan or institutional repositories as well. Um, you know, there are different systems that exist out there today that libraries may use, 
That app may simply be just a simple user interface and connector that allows us to tie those two together and allow them to communicate. Um, ideally, we'd like to see some things that, frankly, we've never really seen before. So maybe some really unique and interesting reporting capabilities, maybe some interesting tools to help predict, ideally, what should be purchased by the library. Um, you know, I'd love to see some applications that really start to harvest or at least examine a lot of the data that's being accumulated in the library and maybe using machine learning to start to do some really interesting things. And, you know, otherwise it could just be as simple as some libraries like a particular circulation app, the app that maybe is the default circulation app that exists in Folio, and maybe that gets modified into another version that maybe appeals to a specific segment or subset of libraries that exist out there in the world. And maybe ideally it's even other vendors coming, even with some of their closed source apps as well. Um, so, you know, maybe for instance, Bywater has some applications that they believe in Koha would be really useful and critical to this um, marketplace, to libraries that have chosen to adopt Folio. Maybe there's pieces of that that become adapted to this to provide more options. Hopefully that provides enough of a, an overview. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Uh, what do you expect the initial server platform for the first beta partner to be? Uh, a cloud service, uh, local hosting, something managed by index data? Uh, it, it kind of run with that question a little bit. So this is something we've actually had some really interesting discussions about. And so the code for Folio is being designed. So if the library chooses to do so, they can install that locally. Um, I personally don't believe lots of libraries are going to want to do that, um, especially in this sort of day and age of cloud hosting. And so, you know, that initial library that adopts this, this is going to be interesting to see in terms of what they choose. I suspect they will be interested in something more cloud-based. Um, the cloud-based hosting we've been looking at right now and working with really um, is Amazon at this point in time. AWS, of course, there's nothing stopping anyone from, you know, moving it and using some other service as well. Um, but, you know, ultimately we see this as a decision that the library makes and we expect particular vendors that sort of jump on or provide folio services and the hosting may have their own cloud services that they fully maintain their own or they may be tied into or based on some of the commercial systems like the AWS and others that exist out there as well. And then I, we also imagine there'll be some vendors that ideally specialize in local installations and hosting as well. Lots of wide open possibilities there. Yes. Um, so the, the community of developers uh, uh, kind of, uh, presents problems with quality assurance. Uh, yes. Can you discuss uh, plans for testing code before deployment? Uh, and do you expect to have a code certification process? So the, um, I don't know if we, well, we will have a code certification process and that was included really in part of the roadmap in terms of build and release management. Um, because someone, some entity, or some group is going to have to make decisions as to what code's being accepted as part of the code base, part of the branch in GitHub, and, you know, does it meet certain criteria? And so these are the things we're trying to work on right now to lay that out ahead of time. Ideally, we'd have a published set of requirements as far as what is the bar the code has to meet. And QA is also an interesting one. And unfortunately, I maybe um, didn't use the best terminology here when I spoke about developers or development teams, because um, ultimately QA is absolutely part of those development teams. And so when we're looking at the community to be able to submit and provide help in terms of these development organizations, 
we fully expect uh, QA to be part of that as well. And so ideally we're getting developers, we're getting um, QA folks, and in many cases I'm going to expect project managers or product owners as, as well um, in really more of the traditional agile sense as well. And so we really need all of that in terms of contributions. In addition to subject matter experts, which will, uh, which are in the process of forming uh, with the uh, SMEs, the subject matter, the, excuse me, the six. Uh, great. Uh, a a question here uh, about uh, historical documents. Uh, uh, the person writes, uh, our institution has a large archive of historical documents and assets that are being uh, digitized uh, in addition to their traditional library assets. Uh, is there a digital asset management functionality on the roadmap? So when we talk about resource management, again, you know, we really are talking about really managing all resources, whatever they may be. Um, you know, in, in some cases, I believe many libraries use their institutional repository to deal and track and manage with this type of data. That is something that's planned and we already know there are at least one vendor, if not more, that are looking to integrate IRs into this system as well. Um, but we fully expect that to support, if we fully expect Folio to support that. To be brutally honest, do we have the detailed requirements of exactly what that looks in a case very specific like this one that was that just mentioned. I don't think we're quite there yet, and that's where um, the special interest groups are going to have to help us contribute to those requirements and what that means and what it needs, what it means to support that. Uh, okay, uh, a a question about uh, multilingual support, uh, which I know is is uh, uh, key to the project. Uh, does the open structure of Folio uh, uh, facilitate multilingual support? It does, or rather it will. Um, the plans are for all of this to be Unicode compliant. Um, however, not everyone working on the code may necessarily have all the experience. And so one of the things we're looking forward to, um, we're getting other organizations really from all around the world that are offering to contribute in some way, shape, or form. And we fully suspect for some of those, for instance, we'll be able to get the expertise in Chinese or, for instance, um, Hebrew or whatever some of these other languages are that really need full support. Because it's one thing to support Unicode, but there's still quite a bit more to it, as all of us know, in terms of localization of user interfaces, dealing with dates, UI design, but then also in terms of storing data, in terms of sorting data, things like that, there's some ex other external expertise that we're going to be pulling in as well to make sure that happens as it needs to. And uh, of course, as, a, as an open community, we want to uh, encourage people to uh, uh, come to the project uh, with those uh, not only those internationalization concerns, but uh, those internationalization skills uh, that they can bring to the project, yes? Yes, absolutely. Uh, who will be responsible for tuning and performance? I is this uh, something that each library will need uh, expertise in to identify and address these kinds of problems? So for tuning and performance, right now the development teams from Index Data, in addition to the four uh, contributed uh, developers from the community, um, their focus um, right now with Okapi, with the UI toolkit, and the persistent subsystems, there is work going on there for performance. That said, as the initial library starts to migrate, this is one of the things we're also going to be looking at as well as well as any QA efforts that go on as well. As requirements are being created and written and placed in JIRA, um, there are requirements, um, there are performance requirements that are part of that as well. Um, 
That said, again, and I jumped around there a little bit, I apologize. Those first libraries that start to onboard, one of the reasons for, I guess, what I would call a partial migration, meaning they don't shut down the old system, they keep the old system running, is really to try out for the first time in real life how the system performs. And so there's definitely going to be tuning and really the community itself, meaning uh, the developers and testers and other folks that are part of that community, ultimately will make adjustments to the code. From there, of course, we expect later on the vendors that start to take that code, make it available, host it themselves. Those vendors, it'll be up to them. There'll be some tuning involved as well. And for those libraries that choose to fully handle this on their own, there may be some tuning there as well. There'll certainly be customizations that, you know, I would expect. Um, and uh, a related question, uh, the, the quality assurance on individual modules, of course, clearly belongs to that module's development team. Uh, but there's a, another level of quality assurance needed for integration. Uh, any thoughts about uh, how to accomplish that? So this is, um, you know, <laughs> I hate to say it, again, part of that build and release management, um, we're going to have to test to make sure an application properly integrates. And we believe that testing is going to have to be part of the requirements as to is that code actually going to be accepted? Is it going to be become part of that code base? Um, in addition, you know, there's QA on the teams themselves, but there's also the greater library community. And, you know, we fully recognize that not all libraries can contribute developers. It's completely unrealistic to expect that. But we do believe there will be significantly more libraries contributing time to help test and these are some of the areas that some of those folks can spend some time on, um, in addition, again, to the subject matter expertise. Uh, great. Uh, another question about uh, uh, developers. Uh, when developing apps or modules, is there any limit on uh, the uh, selection of programming languages? Um, Okapi is completely language neutral. It does not care what language you use. And so, you know, we believe that was required for maximum flexibility in terms of encouraging the community to contribute and develop applications and especially to innovate in areas that ultimately I'm going to assume we just have no idea about right now. Again, we see this as a platform that enables that innovation. And so the great ideas aren't going to probably come from, let's say, someone like me. They're really going to come from out there in the world of libraries, from many cases, libraries themselves. Yes, and, and one of the, the technical underpinnings of this is uh, the, the web architecture. Uh, Okapi, of course, speaks uh, HTTP. Uh, and so whatever programming language you have that uh, uh, can, can speak HTTP will be able to talk to a copy and, and all the services it provides. Absolutely. Uh, how fully integratable are you expecting the major players uh, in discovery uh, library management systems, library services, platforms, et cetera, uh, to be in Folio. Uh, so again, the, the integration with the, the major players and uh, the, the person asking the, the question uh, listed some uh, possible vendors that, that might integrate, uh, but this is certainly not an exclusive list, uh, Innovative, EBSCO, uh, ProQuest, and Cersei Dynex. Okay, so as someone who currently um, is an EBSCO employee, um, I can promise you that everything from EBSCO will interoperate and with Folio. <laughs> that said, we've been we've been having uh, discussions with other vendors, um, some of the ones that were listed, um, and we do know that there are multiple vendors, actually more than the ones that were listed there, that actually 
we're getting at least both a verbal and in some cases even, um, well, a little more than that, in that they fully do intend to work with and support in some way, shape, or form or interoperate with Folio. Um, you know, I believe there have been some market announcements um, and uh, there will be more as time goes on. Um, but it's been really interesting because the enthusiasm that I think we've received from many other organizations out there in the world of libraries has been substantial and it's been very, very positive. And so we expect you'll start to see some really great news really soon now. Great, yes. Uh, a, a question uh, related to uh, quality assurance. Uh, what do you envision the uh, technical support landscape might look like? So the technical support landscape, one of them, um, one of the key ones I believe will be the community itself that's forming around Folio. Um, uh, at the Folio, uh, excuse me, the Folio forum and website. Um, in addition, we do expect the vendors will focus and specialize on Folio as well and be able to provide that for libraries that would uh, rather hold another vendor accountable for something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I have a, a, a softball question here and, and perhaps uh, somebody who's going to uh, step up and volunteer. Uh, can you tell us who the first library is going to be? Um, I can't. <laughs> Peter, can you? <laughs> no, no, I can't, but I've, I, uh, I have this person's name, and uh, uh, if, if that's a uh, request to volunteer, uh, uh, get, get, you know, pack your bags. We're, we're going to go on this journey together. Um, I, I believe there are at least 10 right now that are very interested in becoming one of those early libraries. Um, in fact, I'm, uh, the last I heard, I think there's actually more. So, you know, it's just going to come down to which organization will be able to afford the time in terms of staff resourcing to devote to this. So, yeah, yeah, that that will be a key factor. I. Can you uh, speak to any integration with uh, OCLC and WorldCat? So, um, as far as, so, you know, I mentioned multiple knowledge bases. <laughs> um, we fully expect uh, the WorldCat uh, knowledge base actually to integrate. And we do know um, uh, OCLC has mentioned, you know, they are interested in supporting this. Um, of course, in addition to their knowledge base, there's also the ILL services they provide that we fully expect will integrate as well. Uh, there was a, a question here, I think, that uh, relate, was uh, related to uh, support organizations. Uh, and the, the, uh, the person asks, uh, with a smiley face on the end, uh, fancy naming any of the specific organizations? Uh, I think there have been some in the press releases, but uh, I don't have those off the top of my head. I don't know if you do. <laughs> I don't either, and I can't remember which ones actually issued press releases or not. So at the moment, um, you know, I, I don't want to overpromise, but if you do a search, you'll find the press releases and you'll see who they are. Yep, very good, very good. Um, I can tell you EBSCO is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and index data is, is right there beside you, too. Absolutely. Uh, what factors uh, do you think might impact the uh, pace of the development of the roadmap? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a development project. So, you know, I think the factors that may impact this are really factors that we're trying to mitigate. And one of those key ones being, again, is supporting that multi-team independent app development. Um, the other one, um, I think, uh, which we're also in the process, um, and Olay is providing an enormous amount of help here as well, is um, you know, the startup um, of the uh, 
of the SIGs. And so we need to make sure we have a constant stream of information uh, that can be used and eventually become requirements to provide input for wireframes, UI design work, and you know, to have that opportunity to circle back and get that feedback. Uh, we want to make sure at all costs we're never in a situation where the development team will actually end up stalling because of lack of information. Um, I think one of the other ones that's, you know, I'm personally a little bit concerned about, of course, is the, uh, the build and release management. There's definitely some significant work that has to go there, but, you know, none of these are things that are things that are unsolvable. In fact, they should be relatively easy to solve. We look around, we see there's plenty of examples of successful projects that have done this. Um, and we can look at their successful open source projects that have done this. And so we're looking at how many of them operate, the successful ones, and we're trying to follow the patterns that have been set before us to ensure that this is successful. And, and of course, as, a, as an open source project, uh, uh, sometimes the pace uh, depends on the number of hands we have on keyboards uh, uh, making the uh, the uh, apps happen. So uh, that's also something to to be watching out for. Uh, I just I think I have one more question in queue, uh, and so I will uh, ask that and uh, see if there are uh, other questions. Uh, give people time to. Uh, 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 ask uh, other uh, questions, at least uh, get them into the queue for us. Uh, and that is, uh, how can we stay informed about the progress of this project? So there is the Folio website that you can go to. Um, we also have Slack channels. We have, actually, Peter, can you answer this one for me, the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> I know this one was near and dear to my heart, and I was, I was uh, struggling to, to toss it to you. I, th there are a number of, of communication channels uh, that we're putting in place, uh, starting right from the, the uh, folio.org website, uh, and there's a, uh, a link to uh, get involved uh, that starts to uh, uh, list some of these things. Uh, the, uh, the discussion forums, uh, the events where Folio uh, is going to be presented, uh, the, uh, and, you know, getting deeper into the project, uh, the, uh, the issue tracker and the wiki for documents. Uh, we're also uh, going to be starting uh, a, a newsletter that will summarize uh, uh, the current activities that are happening in the community. Uh, and I am uh, betting uh, by virtue of the fact that you've signed up for this webinar, uh, if you already aren't on uh, the, uh, the Folio interested mailing list, uh, you will be soon. Uh, but you can always send uh, uh, people who are, are um, uh, looking for more information to the folio.org website, and there's a form you can use to uh, sign up for that newsletter. Um, and so, uh, you know, we know that there are, are people that are, uh, like Harry and I, that, that are spending our days uh, in this project, and, and there are people that are, are coming in uh, just a few hours at a time uh, each week. And so uh, we're trying to uh, meet uh, those varying needs uh, with these uh, various forms of communication. Uh, and if you have any ideas uh, for that, uh, be sure to reach out to us. Also, I'd like to add, next time we have this forum, um, I will come prepared with a list of vendors that have signed on. Ah, okay. I am asking my uh, technical team behind the scenes. Uh, thank you, Kristen and Doreen and Michael for supporting me. Uh, is there uh, anything in the uh, question queue that I might have missed? And I am not seeing anything from them. 
so I think we are good. Uh, Harry, thank you so much for uh, presenting on the uh, Folio Roadmap. Uh, you can uh, continue the conversation uh, at the Folio Discussion website. Uh, again, that's discuss.folio.org. Uh, you can, uh, and also using, if you're on Twitter, using the hashtag Folio Forum. Uh, the recording of today's forum will be posted soon to the openlibraryenvironment.org website, uh, so you can go see it there. Uh, the next forum is being planned right now, and uh, you can go to that same website uh, for details when that's released, uh, or watch the uh, folio underscore LSP Twitter account uh, for more details and the link to register. I uh, would also like to point out uh, that uh, at the Code for Lib conference in Los Angeles in March, uh, there are uh, two half-day folio pre-conferences uh, that have been proposed uh, and a uh, talk on folio itself uh, during the main conference. Uh, Code for Lib, uh, the uh, uh, Code for Lib is a community uh, that uh, votes on its proposals, uh, and so if uh, you think you might be going to Code for Lib, uh, and you're interested in hearing more about Folio, uh, uh, please uh, sign into the uh, voting website uh, at Code for Lib and vote for those Folio presentations. Uh, I want to thank our speaker today, Harry. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, and everyone who asked uh, questions and, and added comments. Uh, have a great day, everyone.